So today we're going to be talking about simulation in the context of process improvement and I'm really delighted that our lead for healthcare from the US is here, Brittany Hagedorn. Um, Brittany, you're a lean practitioner first, I think, and then you came to simulation later. Um, I'd love to hear more about your process improvement journey, if you like, and, and how and why you use the different methodologies. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I started uh, my career as a Six Sigma black belt, um, working in a hospital system. And my background being systems engineering, um, I started doing a lot of improvement projects uh, in the hospital on the ground floor, um, on the front line of uh, our care delivery. And what we found is it was very challenging to work with a group of clinicians, uh, usually nurses, um, but not always, also physicians and, and others and get them on board with the change that we wanted to do. Um, even if we had gotten them all together and they had actually designed the future state process, there's still a fear, right? And, and legitimately, um, you're working with patients, right? You're affecting people's uh, health. You want to be very careful about any changes you're going to make. Um, but there was this um, nervousness about actually implementing changes, um, particularly if you were going to increase volumes or you were going to change the schedule or shift responsibilities. Uh, there was a lot of um, angst about actually implementing. And so what we decided uh, after going through this process a few times and, and starting to see the pattern, we said, you know, really we need a tool to visualize what this future state is going to look like and get everybody bought into that future state. Uh, and the lean tools were great in getting the future state designed, but really weren't getting us the change management side of things. And so we brought in simulation specifically as a stakeholder engagement tool uh, to bring everybody around the table, look at what was going to happen, um, be able to understand if there were any downstream effects that we needed to anticipate, and be able to plan ahead for those things. So that's really where we started using simulation, um, or I started using simulation as part of my practice. Uh, and then once you've done a small model, right, and you've had some success, uh, particularly if you get a little visibility, uh, pretty soon the requests start to snowball in um, because people start to see the value of it and, and ask for it on more and more uh, different kinds of projects and to answer different kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty soon we were doing construction projects and, and other things as well. It's really interesting what you're saying about engagement. Um, I just remember you and I did a presentation at Loughborough University at a conference that was exploring lean and simulation. And the way that it was set up um, was to have a lean practitioner and a simulation practitioner, and you covered both, mm -hmm. and then the participants were sort of sat in two corners <laughs> and um, not exactly battling it out, but, but having a debate. And one of the things that came up from the lean practitioner side was that, of course, with the model, the power is in the hands of the modeler, modeler because they're pressing the buttons on the, on the computer, and they felt that that took away from the ability to engage with the wider stakeholders because mm -hmm. people weren't seen to be participating. How do you think both, both methodologies fit? Yeah, so it's absolutely uh, a, a, an important concern, right? You want to make sure that people are engaged in that process. Um, but actually, I've seen it done successfully. Um, there's an organization I was just speaking with, and they are now doing both at the same time, right? Which is a little bit of rework. Uh, but usually you're going to have you know, two folks on a project anyway who are kind of the process uh, tour guides, mm -hmm. right, if you will, uh, or facilitators. And so they, what they have done sometimes is actually had the team putting the process up and, and building it into a simulation at the same time so you can kind of see that it's, it's happening in parallel. Um, or you're using techniques like that to make sure that, that people are feeling engaged in the, the process development. Um, but as long as the, the facilitator, right, the simulator, the person pressing the buttons, is very careful about that, there's no reason that it has to be a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that, you know, as any good facilitator would do, right, they keep their opinions right inside. They, they make sure that anything that's coming out is is facilitating the process for the team um, and not their own perspective. And, and that is the skill of a facilitator, whether they're doing lean or simulation or both. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, because quite often people think <coughs> that simulation is a really complicated thing to do, and it can only be done by the, the real software expert. Yeah. Um, 
And in fact, what you're saying is that really you need to have the facilitation skills as well as the simulation skills. Um, and I'm guessing also from what you're saying that actually somebody doing simulation has to be comfortable enough with the software and their tool to be able to run a simulation live, even though it's not the final validated version right. that you can you can build as people are discussing those ideas. So with um, a rapid improvement event, for example, you could be using the simulation to drive that. And mm -hmm. I know that Warwick University has done some very interesting work around what they call SimLean, which was bringing together um, simulation to facilitate uh, that kind of discussion and bring forward those ideas and perhaps take them make them a bit more concrete than they would have been if it had stayed in the, the lean space. Absolutely. And I think actually that comes to a really important point, which is simulation is a little bit different, right? When I when I lay out my process in a simulator, um, it's a little bit different and I put in a little bit different parameters than I do when I lay it out in lean. And I think there's actually some value there because Specifically, the, the waiting times right, and the delays that happen. Um, in my lean um, toolkit, I would write down the delay, right, the average delay specifically. And that becomes almost an assumption, um, as opposed to the reality, which is that the waiting time is a result of a poorly designed process. And so if I'm going to use a simulation, what I can do is actually generate some conversation around that and say, well, actually, no, that wait time doesn't have to happen. Um, no, that doesn't have to be built into my process. Um, and I can see in real time, if I can facilitate it well, I can see the changes that are going to happen um, and the outcomes that are going to change as a result of modifying the process. And so you can generate a lot of exciting discussion and, and insight uh, by using simulation that way um, in parallel to that process. So you, in your practice, do you tend to use, you, you see the benefits of using both together? Absolutely, yeah. undoubtedly. Yeah. Um, there's a lot with the, the change management, um, the, the engagement part of it, and um, also the, the understanding of variability that simulation allows you to see and to visualize the impact of variability in a way that a static process map just doesn't mm -hmm. capture. Um, we tend to write averages on our um, process maps, and, and we have to go beyond that if we're going to be successful. Yes, no, I, I, I agree. I think that, I mean, particularly in healthcare, that's one of the things that we know that we're going to get peaks and troughs of demands right. every day. And we know that every patient is different. So we know that those things are going to happen. And that's, in the end, that's managing that complexity and making sure you've got the right capacity in the right place is, is what makes it work. Right, understanding that variability that's yeah. going to happen. So given... Given yeah, we're convinced, obviously, <laughs> you're convinced this is what you do. What, why do you think it, people don't bring these techniques together? I think it's a lot of history. It's a lot of this is the way we've done it, which is ironic given that we're process improvement professionals, um, mm -hmm. that we rely on the way it's always been. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple of factors there, right? Just generally speaking, you tend to pull different kinds of people into lean versus simulation. Um, so you tend to have a, a little bit of a difference in the, the training and, and the kind of people who are coming into it. You don't have to be um, traditionally. Um, you get an engineer who builds a simulation, and maybe you get an engineer, but also you get a, a nurse or a patient safety officer who does lean and, and some of those things. And so those are kind of two different perspectives on things. Um, that certainly doesn't have to be the case. Um, and I think one of the challenges for us is that a lot of times people get excited about simulation and want to build everything. I want to simulate my entire hospital. And you're not going to be successful simulating your whole hospital in your first time out. Mm -hmm. And so starting small and building slowly, as your capability grows, as your comfort level grows, you can build more complex models and answer bigger, more complicated questions. That's the right approach, I think, um, and that's going to reduce those barriers, right? And the the challenges that you face when you're first adopting simulation as a tool. And historically, we haven't done that very well, uh, mm. and so I think we carry a lot of that baggage forward. Because there's clearly an overlap, isn't there, between lean and simulation, yeah. and um, and so I suppose we all tend to use what we're most comfortable with, 
Um, Absolutely. So actually, if I can mostly do that, but not quite as well if I use both, does it really matter? Am I still going to get the right outcome? Mm -hmm. How do you think that should be managed? I mean, there is a lot of overlap um, in terms of the philosophies and what you're trying to do. But I think fundamentally, I would not say that Lean and Six Sigma are interchangeable, right? There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of practitioners who do both and who pick and choose the right tools at the right time. Um, lean is not a silver bullet. Simulation is not a silver bullet. There is no one tool set that can do everything. And so we just need to be careful and stop and think about it, right? When do I need simulation and when do I not? Um, when do I need lean and when do I just need a management policy, right? Um, those are important distinctions to make and we just have to sit down and, and think it through um, before we just automatically pick up the tool that's most comfortable, right? Um, there is a lot of shared philosophy though, I think specifically between lean and simulation as opposed to some of the other uh, tool sets BPM and, and others, in that it's Lean really values the pilot, right? The pilot project, the let's test it out before we go live, make sure that we've worked out the kinks. <clears throat> they really value the process orientation. They really value people. And I think what simulation actually allows you to do is implement that philosophy of valuing everybody on the team. Uh, because when you don't have simulation, you can test one maybe two ideas in a pilot. And so you tend to pick the ideas that are incremental and the safest, and you tend to pick the ideas that are brought forward by people with the most respectability, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and simulation lets you actually implement that philosophy of let's listen to everyone, let's test everybody's concept because it only takes me two minutes to do it. So why would I not? And, and it really levels that playing field in a way that um, that sometimes we struggle with with pure lean. So yes. I, I think there's a lot of value there. Do you think perhaps the the way to, I mean, I, I, I work with a lot of academics and they talk a lot about problem structuring and they run programs on problem structuring. Do you think by doing better problem structuring, you might help people to choose the approach rather than, as you say, jumping straight <laughs> into the approach because that's what you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this, the scope is going to define what tool you need to use and what you're trying to accomplish. Yes. Um, on the back side of that, I do think you can use simulation to set the scope, right? Not necessarily specifically to say, you know, I need to work on my uh, admissions process. Simulation may not tell you that. But when you say I need to work on my admissions process and I need to see double the number of patients in the same amount of time, Simulation can tell you, okay, well, you need to work on this bottleneck and you need to change this. This step is going to have to be fixed by 30% or 50%. Um, and so we can set much more realistic and, and evidence-based targets. Um, and so we can use it in more of an iterative approach mm -hmm. um, if we're clever about it. Yeah, yeah. I've been really interested to look at the research that's been done by Eric Holnagel around mm -hmm. um, patient safety, and, well, about safety in, in general, and thinking about some of the, the, the things, the, the techniques people use in patient safety um, in order to explore what's happened and, and, and to improve it, really. Um, and this whole idea of using techniques to look backwards to see what's gone wrong and, and then um, as against looking forwards, which I think he describes as safety one and, and safety two. And, and that seems to me to um, really sum up the sort of thing that you can use simulation for, yes. because simulation really is a, an excellent way of predicting how to make things go right. <laughs> Whereas that sort of looking backwards view is about, you know, um, finding out why things go wrong. And it, it, when when he expresses it, you think, well, you're saying the same thing, but it, it's not. There's this subtle difference about uh, being able to predict how you make things go right in the future, which is that looking for piece, the, which is different from the looking back. Yeah, you're really describing the difference between data analytics and simulation. Yeah, right? yeah. Patient safety one and safety two. Yeah. A lot of overlap. So thanks very much for, for watching this. Um, lean and simulation process improvement, 
all the different techniques we've got to use to improve healthcare, I think is a conversation that's going to run and run. Um, there are many different views for and against, but the communities that are involved in those, those two areas are, are two communities who are desperate to improve healthcare, which is, I think, the thing that binds us together. So being able to find ways of combining those sorts of methodologies ought to really improve our, our process improvement.